Okay, so we are going to um, just do a very short, short demo of uh, doing a Nova in R. Okay, so one is uh, I got to get the data into R, and uh, there's a few ways to do this. If you have a small data set, you can just do it manually, as I have done here. Okay, and so one will create vector of all of your numeric values. Okay, so this is the sheep weight gain thing, and so I just said 18, 8, 16, 9, 19, these are all the, the weights, okay? And then I'm going to create a second vector indicating which diet uh, each sheep was on, okay? And so I'm creating a vector called diet, it goes 1, 1, 1, meaning the first three values are on diet 1, and then 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, meaning the next five values are on diet 2, so on and so forth. I include this line as dot factor to tell R, you know, you're going to see these numbers 1, 2, and 3, but don't treat them as numbers, because if it sees them as numbers, you know, then it'll think we have a numeric value variable and a numeric variable, okay? This is actually a categorical variable. So I'm telling R, look at it as what we call a factor, and then it treats these as categorical variables. Okay. So I've got weight, and I've got diet, and I'm going to do uh, an analysis of variance, and I want to understand weight as explained by diet. And there's a few ways to do this, and one uh, simple way is AOV for analysis of variance. being broken down as diet and residuals. And it says degrees of freedom is 2, 9, 36, 210, and 18, 23, 3, which is exactly what we got. And the F statistic, 0.771. Okay. And here it calculates your p-value as 0.491. So that's a uh, very simple, simple way to do uh, one-way ANOVA in R. Uh, that's that. Okay. Yes? Okay, sorry. That's confusing because it's one way. So one-way ANOVA, I don't know why they put it away. Okay. I guess they should just call it one factor. Okay, so that doesn't have to do with the whole direction. Probably be better if we call it one factor in OVA. I don't, I'm not sure why it's called such, but um, yeah, because we could introduce more things, and, uh, and I'm so you are only responsible for knowing how to do one way in OVA by hand. Okay, you don't have to worry about doing this in R, but I just want to demo that you could do it in R. <coughs> and then um, I'm going to just briefly talk about maybe a few of the more complicated versions of R, or not R, of ANOVA that exist, but, um, but you are not responsible for learning the calculation methods, okay? Uh, okay. And we'll learn, okay, okay. Uh, you have a, uh, another simple lab
I was looking for an article with simple one-way ANOVA, and uh, most of them use a slightly more complicated ANOVA, which we will not cover. All right, so this is age-related differences in factors associated with smoking initiation. Okay, so basically, they went around and they surveyed a whole bunch of people um, who smoke. Well, I guess they surveyed a bunch of people you smoke, and if they said no, then they said you're not eligible. So anyway, the people who smoke, they asked all these questions, and one of them, the, the response variable that they were interested in is, when did you start smoking? Okay, so some people say, I started smoking when I was 16, others say, I started smoking when I was 18, or I started smoking at this age or this age, okay? So they asked, when did you start smoking? And then they asked a bunch of other things, that there's demographic, demographic information here, gender, your race, uh, this and that, um, and, and they also asked uh, questions related to your smoking habits. And they performed uh, ANOVA analysis to see what, um, what things were uh, significantly related, okay? And they, they said they, the reason why they did this was so they could figure out So each of these, this table at first might be a little hard to read, but can you, can you see this? Do I need to blow this up? So they surveyed 1,447 people, okay. and the average age at which someone started smoking was 17.5, and with standard deviation of 3.8. Okay. And I don't know how specific they were. Did they say, you know, do you remember the exact month or, you know, I don't know what they did. Okay. So anyway, you see these uh, italicized things that says gender, okay, men, women. So, so this, they just did a t-test. There's two groups, 807 men, 640 women. The average age that men started smoking was 16.8. Average age for women started smoking was 18.3. And that difference has a p-value of less than 1 in 1,000. Okay, so age is significantly related to They did uh, ethnicity, okay, and uh, they, I guess they only looked at uh, F3, okay, non-Hispanic white, Hispanic African American. These are the different ages at which they started smoking, okay, mean age, and so the means were 17.3 years, 17.5, and 18.4, and so here they did one-way ANOVA, and the result of that one-way ANOVA gave a p-value of 0.001, okay. And they did that for education level uh, and other demographic things. Okay, and then here's the other table, and this is with uh, smoking-related habits. Okay, they ask things like, how many cigarettes do you smoke a day, all right? And uh, some smoke more than 20, 20 or more a day, so that's, uh, I guess it's an entire pack, and those uh, smoke less than a pack of cigarettes a day, and it seems that uh, there is something significant happening here, okay. All right, so for your lab, I'm just asking you to kind of do a manual analysis, pick one of these categories, and do a manual ANOVA analysis. So uh, 
you, because you have the mean and you have the standard deviation, which is pretty much all you need to get an F ratio. Okay. So um, perform a manual ANOVA analysis and just kind of verify that the p-value that you get aligns with the p-value that they produce in their report. Okay. Of course, it's not going to be exactly the same uh, because of some rounding issues and things, things like that. Okay. But I do um, I did a little demo of, uh, of what I'm looking for, uh, which I think should make it very clear. So this is uh, they give you the uh, the mean and the standard deviation and the count, which is all you need to do, which is all you need, and you can create the ANOVA table by hand. just talk uh, a little bit about some of the other um, maybe more complicated analysis that exist. Okay. So again, you are only responsible for knowing one way ANOVA and how to carry that out. Um, but you should know what, what else is out there. And if you ever have, feel like you will ever do, your, do research of your own or set up an experiment or be involved in something, I recommend taking a class on ANOVA or, uh, and design of experiments. Okay? It's probably probably be the same class, design of experiments slash ANOVA, or I might just say design of experiments, and I'm pretty sure they will do ANOVA and <laughs> design it. Otherwise, it's a, I don't know what kind of design of experiments class that is. Okay. Um, did I talk about blocked design experiments at all? No. Okay. So that's a good time to talk about blocked design. Okay. So, Let's say you are interested in how um, I don't know, different fertilizers affect plant growth. So let's say you've got a, um, you have a greenhouse. This is a top view of a greenhouse. And you're going to grow a bunch of tomatoes in here, okay? You're growing, growing tomatoes. And you hear, oh, if you add this to the water, it will help grow, make the tomatoes grow bigger and tastier. We'll, we'll, let's just go on <coughs> tomato weight, all right? So you're going to try out a few things, okay? You have a control group where you, you're just going to give them water, okay? And then you have um, treatment group one, and you're going to do, uh, I don't know, some, uh, some type of uh, fertilizer. Group two, I don't know, you do something else. Right? Does anyone know anything about growing tomatoes? What else would they say? You add something, okay. More um, sunlight. What's that? More sunlight. Uh, no, I'm gonna, the sunlight will be coming part of the block. Mm -hmm. So just something that you're adding to the water. Okay, some other magic chemical. Okay. All right, so um, magic. 
magic term. All right, miracle. Group. All right, and then okay. So we, you want to know: Do any of these three things have an effect? So these are your groups, and do they have an effect on the weight of the tomatoes produced? Okay. So our response. Make sure that um, what you observe actually happens. You have multiple plants. So let's say you've got um, three control plants, three in group one, and three in group two. Uh, actually, three is not it. Let's do uh, six of each. Okay. Sorry. Six of each point. Six of each point. So when you uh, when you're arranging these 18 plants in the um, greenhouse. greenhouse. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what happened. <laughs> okay. Um, so as you're arranging these 18 plants in the greenhouse, what you're interested in is the you're interested in the effect of these uh, treatments or the control group on the weight of tomatoes, okay? We already know that sunlight plays a role in the growth of tomatoes, okay? And so we're not interested in knowing does having more sun help the tomatoes or not. We already know that you want to give your tomatoes some sun, okay? So when you put your uh, tomato plants in here, there's, what you do not want to do, okay, is you do not want all six, uh, let's say all six of group two to be over here, all six of group one to be here, and all six of the uh, control group to be over here, okay? So this would be a bad design. If all six magic chemical fertilizer end up in the most sun, all six of the regular fertilizer end up in sun some, some sun, and the six control plants end up in the least sun zone, then at the end of the experiment, let's say you find out that these six plants produce the heaviest tomatoes and these six plants produce the smallest tomatoes. Okay. What you won't know then is whether the reason why these produced the smallest tomatoes was because they had the least amount of sun or because they were in the control group with water only. Okay? And same with this one. You don't know if they produced big tomatoes because they had the most sunlight or because they had um, the magic chemical. So what would happen here is that your um, your treatments are confounded. Uh, that's the technical term for mixing. 
mixed up with the blocking variable. be a bad design. Okay. If you did a complete random design, we could still run into some problems. It is possible that by random chance alone, a lot of the magic chemical plants end up over here. Let's say four magic chemical plants end up here, and one fertilizer and one uh, control plant end up in the most sun area. Okay? It's possible that that happens by random chance. Okay, and so at the end of the day, when you look at the data again, you're not entirely sure if what you're observing is a result of the sunlight or the chemical or the fertilizer or whatever it is that we're looking at. Okay. So we do something called block design in that we make sure that for this blocking variable, in our case, it's the sunlight. We make sure that we have two control plants, two from group one, and two from group three. Okay, we make sure we have um, each of the groups, each of the treatments equally represented in the different uh, sunlight zones. six control plants, when you pick the two to go into the most sun area, you pick those two at random. Okay, you don't just say these first two plants, because something could... Hey, but could you just do two, two, and two? Yes, you, you will do two, two, and two. But when you pick the two from the control group, oh. you're going to pick random them at pick random. Sometimes it feels like, oh, there's no sense in when I just pick something arbitrarily, it feels random, but it might not necessarily be the case. I don't know if I talked about this, but let's say you had, um, uh, it's not an aquarium or a tank, when like hamsters or mice live in something, what is it? Just a cage? No, oh, okay, all right. So if you have a cage of mice, yeah. <laughs> If you have a cage of mice and you just reach in and you grab a mouse, okay, is that a random mouse? Mm, yeah. I don't know. The Maybe answer is like hands. The answer is no, okay? Yeah, you might get mice that like hands, <laughs> or you might get you're more likely to get slow, slow moving mice than um, than quick ones when if when you just reach into the cage, okay? And so, to make sure you have random selection, you first have to number all the mice, then randomly select a number, and then you pick that mouse, okay? Because if you just reach in and you just grab a mouse, it might feel like it's random, but it's not. Okay? You're more likely to get a slow mouse or something like that. Okay, one that didn't run away. Same with fishing and all of those things. It's, it's hard to do true random samples in real life. And, and that's a topic we don't cover very well in this class. Okay. 
you can actually take another course devoted entirely to sampling and trying to make sure you get random samples or representative samples. Um, it's very hard to do in real life. But, but all of our statistical analysis depends on quality samples. So anyway, okay. This is randomized block design. You make sure each treatment is equally represented in each block, okay? And a block or the blocking variable is generally a variable that is known or suspected to affect the treatment, not the treatment, affect the response. Okay. But whose effect we are not directly interested in. Sometimes it's a variable that we have little control over, too. Okay. Also, generally, otherwise, if we had control over the variable, we would just try to set all, um, all plants or all treatments to have the same conditions. Because okay. ideally, in the experiment, all of your plants, all of your subjects have the same conditions except for the treatment. Okay. But sometimes there's something that you don't have control over and you want to account for it in your analysis even if you're not directly interested in it by itself. Okay. So that is the randomized block design. And, uh, and essentially, your ANOVA, when you create your ANOVA table, source, sum of uh, degrees of freedom, sum of squares, mean squares, etc., etc., you will have a um, treatment variable, a block variable, a blocking variable, a residual, and then still have only one variable that you're interested in, and then you have something like a nuisance variable that exists that you're trying to talk about. And you don't have to worry about calculations. And then you have the uh, factorial design. In uh, factorial design, you might have two variables that we're both interested in.
Okay, so let's say uh, we're still growing tomatoes, but we got a new greenhouse that everybody has the same amount of sunlight, okay? Uh, and we're still interested in, um, maybe we have, uh, so uh, one treatment is, Distilled water, or let's say mineral water, I don't know, versus uh, what other water? Uh, ion ionized water. So we're trying out two different things of water, okay? So maybe the water has an effect, maybe it doesn't. Maybe these treatments have an effect, maybe it doesn't, okay? And it's also possible that maybe um, miracle Grow interacts with ionized water so that under regular mineral water, regular water, it behaves a certain way, but then if you switch the water, maybe it kicks into hyper mode or something, okay? So we are interested in the treatment and also the possible interaction between the treatments, okay? So when you do your analysis, you'd have variable one, variable two, the interaction and the residual. So you are not, um, you don't have to know the, the math behind it, but you should know that they exist, okay, and you're responsible for one way or another. Um, okay, any questions? Okay, okay. well, in that case, uh, we might just end early then, if that's all right, okay, unless there's objections. <laughs> So there is a quiz next week, uh, just like every other quiz, I've got this detailed on the page, okay? Thank you. Class is over, yeah. <laughs>